Hello, bookworms. Welcome to Best Book Ever, the podcast where we talk about your favorite books. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and my guest today is Elizabeth Essex. Elizabeth is the award-winning author of critically acclaimed historical romance, including Reckless Brides and her new Highland Brides series. When she's not rereading Jane Austen, mucking about in her garden, walking her beloved dogs, Gilly and Brogue, or simply messing about with boats, Elizabeth can always be found with her laptop, making up stories about heroes and heroines who live far more exciting lives than she says she does. It wasn't always so. Long before she ever set pen to paper, Elizabeth graduated from Hollins College with a BA in Classics and Art History and then earned her MA in Nautical Archaeology from Texas A&M University. While she loved the life of an underwater archaeologist, she has found her true calling writing lush, lyrical historical romance full of passion, daring, and adventure. Elizabeth lives in Texas with her husband, the indispensable Mr. Essex, and her active and exuberant family in an old house filled to the brim with books. In other words, she is a kindred spirit. I'm so happy that Elizabeth is here with me today to tell me why Lessons in French is the best book ever. For more information on how to support this podcast, check out my Patreon. For about the cost of a latte, you can have access to exclusive interview clips that are only available to my patrons, advance access to the books we discuss, and more. Go to patreon.com, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash best book ever to learn more about how you can help me keep the candles burning over here in my reading cave. Now, back to the show. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, so happy to be here today. Thank you. Elizabeth, before we start anything, I want to start with my one main question. I was in love with you before I even met you because of your name. Aww, that's (laughs) marvelous. Can I assume this is a pen name? Yes, it is. It's a combination of my real name and the place where I grew up. Oh, Um, no kidding. Yeah. So uh, some people guess that I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, but I didn't. Um, <laughs> my real name is Elizabeth, but I grew up uh, in Essex, Connecticut. And when I was first published, um, my agent and the editor who acquired me wanted me to be EE. They were very, very EE. It had to be EE. And um, they suggested Elizabeth Elliot. And I gasped and said she was the mean horrible sister in persuasion and I did not want to be the mean horrible sister in Jane Austen's persuasion thank you very much and could we possibly think of Essex and they said yes oh that's perfect so so I I assumed it was a nod to English history well yes and no the town was uh founded in the 1600s so uh it was very early English settlement and um, they often named their towns after mm-hmm. places they had come from. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't off the top of my head tell you the entire uh, saga of the founding of Essex, but it's also in the, the town is also in one of my favorite books growing up that I read over and over and sort of the book that really made me a reader, uh, which was The Witch of Blackbird Pond by Elizabeth George Spear, which happened along the Connecticut River and Essex, Connecticut is in the book. So, Do you want to hear something bizarre? I just finished that book yesterday. No. Yes, because (laughs) I am recording a podcast episode next week for a guest who chose that as her all-time favorite book. Oh my goodness. And and you must tell me who that is because A, I want to chime in like listen and then I want to be her friend because (laughs) it was that was one of my choices when I when you asked me what I wanted to talk about um so yay so funny I was expecting when I started this podcast I was expecting repeats of course but I never would have guessed that this would be one that's it it is a really phenomenal book it's so good I had forgotten how good it was yeah it spoke to 12 year old me (laughs) <laughs> a long, long, long time ago, but it it 
it taught me about sticking to your values and taking care of other people and watching out for the outsider and feeling like the outsider. And I just adore the book. There's lessons to be learned from every character. It's just loved it. Love it still. I'll have to go reread it after this. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun reread and it's still very relevant, which was interesting. Were you a really big reader when you were a kid? Uh, I was not. I was an okay reader. Um, I was dyslexic, which really didn't know much about when I was a kid. Um, I had trouble learning to read, but I loved books because my mother read to me. Uh, she read to all of us constantly. Um, and the stories, I loved the stories. I became a really good reader in the sixth grade. I went to a new school uh, and it had an open library, which you could go to at any time, which was a very new thing for me. I'd gone to schools before where you went to library period once every two weeks and you weren't allowed to take the books away and other things like that. But at this new school, the library was open at any time and you could check books out yourself. All you had to do is take the card out, write your name down, put it down, off you went with the book. You could take as many books as you wanted. Um, and just had a very, I had a really good English class that gave me a marvelous list of books. I think it was probably Newberry books that first got me started. Um, and that I was off and reading after that, just everything I could get my hands on. Stories of adventure, uh, stories that of people finding bravery, all those kinds of things. Just, I loved. I still love. Do you still read everything you get your hands on? Or are yes. you mostly a romance reader? No. Um, honestly, right here next to me at my desk, um, we have the book we're going to talk about, but I've got some poetry by Robert Frost. I've got The Goose Girl by Shannon Hale, which is a YA middle grade book that my daughter um, recommended. Uh, I was talking to her about some examples of good writing, and she said, oh, you have to try this. So I just read that. And it's marvelous. Um, from Cabin Boys to Captains, 250 Years of Women at Sea. Always a big topic for me. And um, <laughs> Secret and Most Confidential Intelligence in the Age of Nelson. So I'm, I've always got books half open. I read all sorts of things uh, going at the same time. But I really like to be able to fall into a book and just forget everything else. That's a really um, eclectic mix that you just it is. me. It is. And actually, the, the book that I just finished um, on my phone is um, Manny by, not Manny, I keep calling him that. Um, it's Rafe, a, male, a buff male nanny by Rebecca Weatherspoon. So <laughs> I read everything that, that just takes my fancy. And sometimes I'll read... A little of something for a while and okay I'm I don't always finish everything I probably do in the end but I don't know I can't always read historicals uh -huh. um, they're hard for me to read I get jealous <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard thing to admit but I I do I get I get jealous of and sometimes it's a beautiful jealousy Laura can say I'll, I go to read because I know it's going to be so beautiful. I know it's going to inspire me. I know um, I get a lot of pleasure out of it. And How did you find Laura Kinsale? Do you remember the first time you came across her? Uh, I don't. I remember the first book I wrote, read, which was Flowers in the Storm. And I don't remember how I came across it. But I remember it quite vividly because we were on a big family trip. And... I kind of disappeared into the book and it was people were sort of like trying to get me to do things that I didn't want to do. And that honestly, that's probably one of the books that made me want to try to write and that taught me the kind of writing I wanted to do um, because I thought it was so emotional and so um, hard and it's, 
this very engaging tale of a genius Duke who has a stroke and he's sort of trapped inside his own brain. And this young Quaker woman who takes it upon herself um, as an, as an opening, uh, sort of a, a personal mission to help him. And um, it's a marvelous, marvelous book. And I sob every time I read it. Uh, and then I read everything else that Laura Kinsale had ever written after that. Uh, Lessons in French was written, I don't know when it was written, but it wasn't published until 2010. And I was already um, a published author. And I either met her or somebody said, oh, Laura Kinsale has something new. But you're not going to like it because it's not like her other books. And I thought, I don't care what it's like. I just, and I read it and I love it because it's not like the angsty books that we had expected of her. It's, it's a souffle. <laughs> but if you've ever baked or tried to make something frothy and light that just tumbles along, it's exquisitely hard. And I think the light touch in Lessons in French is exquisite and I think it may have been harder to write than any of the super angsty things I also love. I love your description of a souffle so much. I also I just adore her way with language. She captures characters so so vividly and and language and I think she uses in in this case you know, I think the language is like the eggs and she's just <laughs> beat them and frothed them up superbly because the whole story, you know, can sort of hang on the language. It's, yes. you know, it's a, it's a story. She's a wallflower. He's a bad boy. That sounds like a story we've read a hundred million times. And we love, we love that trope, the wallflower trope. I love it, but it's, it's unique and fresh with language. Can you describe the plot of this for our listeners who may not have read it? Uh, Sure. So uh, our heroine, Lady Callista, is what she calls a, um, she was a gifted wallflower. She (laughs) figured out, she's been jilted three times. She's a plain girl who lives at home in the country in this very small village and you'll get a very lovely view of village life and all the villagers are very particular characters. But when she was young, a French emigre family moved in and she took lessons in French with Madame, but fell in love with Trev, Trevelyan her son, uh, and lessons continued, not always in French, (laughs) which is just one of the most exquisite things I've ever read. You know, just, it's just, just absolutely divine. So he comes back to the town. Um, He has uh, allegedly brought back all the family fortune, um, but he has come back because his mother is dying of, the consumption. She has tuberculosis. It's never spoken that we don't, she doesn't, nobody says consumption. Nobody ever says tuberculosis, but we get that. She can't breathe. She is always coughing. Uh, she is fading away. She gets the big bloom of, of an inner cheeks. And so he's come back to be with his chère maman. And of course he and Callie fall madly and inappropriately back in love because she helps him take care of his mother. She arranges things and she, she is his home. She is the one person for him just the way he is the one person for her. So everything goes wrong. Um, there are adventures. There's a stolen bull. She <laughs> raises, she is into animal husbandry. She is this village girl who has prize winning bulls that she is very, very proud of. And she does a marvelous job with it. She is an expert and we see her expertise, which is another thing I really love. Um, We're invested in her bull and (laughs) the adventure that he tried. So her, 
someone in her family gambles away the bull and she has no power to stop that. So the bull goes away and then Trev tries to buy the bull back, but somehow the bull gets stolen. It really wasn't stolen. It wandered away. It was stolen. Everybody's looking for the bull. Everybody is out against them. And it's this marvelous romping escapade filled with these deeply, deeply personal moments of intimacy between the two of them. And I, that's not, that's, that's a very bad description. No, oh. it's a great description. <laughs> it is an escapade. The only thing you forgot to mention is how funny it is. I it is. laughed out loud several times. I think on page two. Yes, this is page two. The goats being commoners very properly kept their opinions to themselves. themselves. I love I it. Several times she talks about the goats being commoners. <laughs> yeah, indeed. She and her father and her sister and their acquaintance and all the local gossips and probably two or three of the wiser village goats had spent a good deal of time dissecting the matter. <laughs> and then later we get the, oh, they were commoners, so their opinion can be discounted. That's right. Oh, it's just, <laughs> it is know. a very funny book. And of course, the other thing I loved, I agree, I love a wallflower story too, but the fact that she was the ripe old age of 27. Just and I loved me. also that they are both 27. Yes. And they're equals in so many things. And they are equals in their escapades. And they are equal in their attraction to each other. Um, I really, really adored that. But yes, the ripe old age, a spinster at 20 and seven. Yeah. <laughs> seven and 20. I'm not sure how it should be said, but yes. What is it about Regency that we love so much? Like, why is it that era? There's a certain lightness that we think comes with the Regency. Um, there's a certain sort of set of language that we think comes with the Regency. There's a certain amount of Clarity and cleanliness, too, quite frankly, um, that we think comes with this era. Um, it's really, or the, the era right before it, which interests me a lot, I like writing about the 1790s, is very much like our own era now. It's interesting times. There's a lot going on. There's, you know, the 40 years before the Regency, uh, political systems are upended. The enlightenment has happened. There's all these ideas being put into use. It's just before the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. And I think that is really what's key here. It's before industrialization. We sort of have the bucolic ideal is still in place. And it's very much, this, the bucolic ideal is very much a part of this book, The Rural Idol. Um, and I think that novels were invented in this period to some extent. You have Sir Walter Scott and um, Jane Austen, and the idea of the novel comes into fore during this period. You have romanticism that happens in this period, and the the romantic poets and their uh, adoration of nature, their sort of um, exaltation of nature and I think that it, all of those things combine together and I think it's a pretty period it is and I think I think we think of it as a pretty period because we focus on this idea of pretty people yes, <laughs> you know like right. we do today we don't we don't necessarily always nobody writes a reality show about people um <sighs> living from paycheck to paycheck they don't that no we want to see the kardashians and all that money and all that excess we want to have the fantasy that we know it's going to be okay yeah and i think it, it works for romance romance is the promise that everything's going to be okay at the end and regency sort of gives us a nice vehicle for that mm. We always, if we think of the Industrial Revolution and we think of Victorian times, we don't always think of that it's going to be okay. We know little Nell may die. We know that Miss Havisham may go mad. Mm. We, Pip may not come out okay. Estella might be a real right bitch. 
all the way through. We don't, you know, you get that edginess into Victorian and the darkness that comes with it that I think people think, oh, Regency, everything was still nice. I read a book once that was um, a modern, uh, it was a Jane Austen adjacent book where somehow the woman was transported back to Oh, yeah. Lost in Austin. Is that what it is? Where she, it, she's got this very romantic view, but then she's like, oh, my God, everybody has B.O. Yeah. <laughs> is that the one that I'm thinking I think of? it's Lost in Austin. Yeah. There, but, Lost in Austin is a variation on that theme. Yeah. Um, where she she goes through the back of her, her bathroom and she goes into Lizzie's house. But Lizzie comes through and wants to live her life, which is very interesting. And she I makes. Uh, I'm going to have to look at them now because I can't. Rem- I just remember thinking it was so funny that we do have this very, pr- like you said, pretty view of it. It was all so yeah. delicate, and she was like, "Actually, hygiene was very different." Well, and I think that that gets into the idea of, um, you know, clothes were lighter. Mm. There is this ideal in the clothes too, um, and when we fantasize about the period and that often the people that we write about have money. So they have servants who can, you know, take those buckets of water up the four flights. It's never, we don't talk about that. We talk about the lovely warm bath. Mm -hmm. So we pretend they're all very clean. (laughs) Right. Do you only write Regency? Uh, I write 1790s as well. Um, What's that era called? uh, The Georgian period, I'd say. It's sort of the end of... uh, The end of the Georgian era, uh, wastes are coming up higher. Um, The French Revolution happens in this period. Uh, Lots of things. Napoleon rises in this era. Um, And I think it's, I don't know, I find it really interesting. I think the clash of ideals, idealism, and reality is really very interesting. So I like it, but it, it feeds into the Regency. So it's not terrifically different. What is your research like? Do you travel a lot to learn for these books that you write? Um, you know what? When I started writing, I didn't travel a lot. And I have since traveled. And the traveling taught me that it's lovely and fun, but the book is a voyage in my mind. And I have written things that my process has done a beautiful job with and then later gone to check to make sure when I could afford it. So I'll I'll just give you an example. I wrote a book called After the Scandal, um, which is a starts, it's a starts very darkly. Um, It's a man who's devoted, he's sort of the wallflower and he is devoted to this woman he's never met. And he is, adored her from afar and circumstances happen that she's about to be date raped um, at a ball. Somebody has her up against a wall in a boathouse and he intervenes and things ensue from there. But they sort of escape out onto the river from this boathouse. And I wrote it out of my imagination. I wrote it out of my imagination, just sort of, reaching out with my brain to what I thought it would sound like and what I thought it would feel like, because the feeling is more important than the actual reality. Um, And I wrote this very long, long scene at the beginning of the book, which is a transition of her trusting him. But the journey down the river is that movement to trusting him. Um, I didn't know that when I wrote it, that that's what it was going to be. It turned out that that's what it was afterwards. And I, then I went back and said, oh, let's make it look like I meant that. <laughs> but years later, after I'd written the book, uh, I was on a trip up to Hampton Court uh, with my daughter and a very good friend. And we went up the river. We decided to take a boat. And it was sort of the opposite of the trip in the book. But it was very true to life. And that was the moment when I realized I didn't really need veracity in my research. I needed imagination and I need some facts to, you know, hang my hat on my imaginative hat on, so to speak. But 
it's the feeling that's really the most important thing. So those feelings are really more important than almost anything else. I think getting into my own imagination is the hard part and seeing, seeing the book that I want to write in my head, like it's my own little private movie is Mm. more important than research. Mm. I have heard that historical romance readers are the ones who are the most likely to write in with, actually, she wouldn't have had that kind of bow on her shoe kind of letters. Yes. (laughs) Is that true? That is very true. I have, and sometimes it's fellow authors who say things like, well, you almost got it right. Oh, Um, (laughs) wow. But I've gotten a few of those letters and let me just put it this way. They are never wrong. Mm. First of all, they're engaged enough in a book that something mattered to them. That is a gift. Mm -hmm. So I always say, start by saying thank you. And oftentimes I say, I am so glad to know this now, even if I knew it or even if it's wrong. (laughs) I had somebody write me very kindly about uh, the couple's dance in uh, Mad About the Marquis, and it was a Scottish Cayley dance, and I called it the Dashing White Sergeant, and uh, she said that it wasn't uh, the right dance. And I wrote back saying, oh my gosh, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for letting me know. I had checked with this friend of mine who was a Highland dance champion and I thought it was um for three couples which is not the same as saying it's a dance for six so it turned out that it really was a dance for six because it was three couples but okay all I had to do is say thank you to her and ask her for more information and tell her my sources that I got it from and we worked it out but I never ever object because people are engaged enough to tell you that really, you know, I don't think it was a, okay, the men. I have a few men who have written me about uh, <laughs> Almost a Scandal, which is a book about the Royal Navy, and it takes place on a Royal Navy ship. And I have been condescended to um, in that instance. And they get, those are the only ones who get my backup, because they they come from a place of assumption that they naturally know more than I do when that is not indeed the case. And why isn't that the case? Um, uh, I have a background in nautical archaeology and I studied and excavated shipwrecks of here in America. We called it the war of 1812. And so this era and the Royal Navy of that era is a huge background that I have. Um, I also grew up in Essex, Connecticut, sailing boats, and I'm a very (laughs) good sailor. And um, even though I live in landlocked Texas now, um, I have not forgot those things that I learned (laughs) in my childhood. And I have not forgotten the years and years of research that I did on um, this era. But it's it's the assumption that they come Mm -hmm. in with the condescension that bothers me. Now, when somebody comes to me and says, oh, the dashing white sergeant is a... I say, oh, okay. But when somebody says, you know, you almost got it right, you know, if you'd only. But, you know, I like that about, about Regency readers or historical readers. I love that they care. That passion is something that I think historical writers uh, can do what they want to with it. What I like to do is honor it. And I think it, it's, in, it's important to me to try to get everything as absolutely right as I can. But I also know that the feeling that goes with those things is more important than the actual detail. Mm. That's quite a pivot, nautical archaeology to yeah. historical romance writer. Yes and no. Yeah, I don't know. I um, One of the things that I did was research for other writers um, when I was uh, an archaeologist. And um, one of those writers, it was a big, he's a big name writer, and he writes adventure with uh, an archaeologist hero. And anyway, I, I did some research for him. And one of the things he said to me was, you have a really great flair for historic narrative. 
you have a flair for the narrative of the story. And I think that comes from being an, an archaeologist has to make a story out of the few little things that we find. And that's how I do my make a story. I find a few little things that are actual, and then I start to see the picture. And I don't plot. I just kind of get along and see how the story comes to be. And I find things as I go along that make the picture clearer and clearer and clearer. And that's the way I was an archaeologist, because you only find what you find. You can't make something out of it that it's not. You can't pretend you found something that's not there. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can only work with what comes along. Um, and anyway, so this author told me I had a great flair for historic narrative. And I thought at the time I was very ill um, and I could not work as an archaeologist. So I thought, oh, I'll try writing books. And I actually really liked it. Um, and and I, I got successful at it fairly quickly. And I had success with my first manuscript. So I, I, was, I was lucky. But I'd been writing as an archaeologist and writing historic narrative for years at that point. So Mm -hmm. it really wasn't that far of a stretch. And I think I went to romance in particular because um, shipwreck archaeology is a tragedy of some sorts in some ways, no matter what you're doing. Uh, Things have gone badly. Uh, The ship is not on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people have died. Sometimes people have died dramatically. Um, but all in all, it's a failure of one sort or, no, or another. And I liked the idea of romance because good things happen. And even if there are shipwrecks, and I've written shipwreck books, um, that one's called A Scandal to Remember. Uh, even if it's, you know, something bad has happened, I, make it, I can make it come right in the end, which is what I really love about romance. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I always come back to it. I always come back to it. Even I love other things. I've written other things, but for my own soul, I need to read romance. Mm-hmm. So. so what are you reading right now? Well, I guess you showed me your, that's your stack. That's, stack uh, that's just what tier. Um, I've also been reading, uh, I went on a historical mystery spree recently because I've been writing some historical mystery or at least attempting to. Um, So I have been reading Sherry Thomas's Lady Sherlock series. Oh, I love those books. Yes. And I'm another person whose voice just enthralls me, just enthralls me. I love her facility with language. I think it's very precise and it's elegant and it's, it's specific. Don't you think it's fantastic that. how the Sherlock story has taken on so many different lives yes. over the years? I think it is. I think that's that it that it persists through fan fiction and that um, Sherry calls what she does pastiche, where she has taken somebody else's idea and remolded it and used all of the basics. Um, she was just discussing this with me recently that she gave her Charlotte Holmes a sugar addiction because I was complaining I had gained weight reading these books because there's always <laughs> macaron and plum pudding and all of these pastries and eclairs. And I'm hungry every moment that I'm reading these books for the taste of sugar to suffuse my mouth. But that's the gift of her writing. First of all, that it's so vivid that that happens, but she, she instead of making this brilliant young woman, an opium addict, which Sherlock Holmes allegedly was, she's given her an addiction to sugar. She's also given her a Mrs. Holmes. Um, I, love the, I love the juxtaposition of it, but it's that basic character that's mm-hmm. smarter than the rest of us. Mm-hmm. And we all want to be shown what we can't see. And I think that's the enduring appeal of that character, that we want to see more. And we want to see, for any character, any character in any book that's that draws you in, you begin to see the world through their eyes. And I think that for Sherlock, we want to see what he or she sees, Charlotte uh, Holmes in this case, that um, we want to see the things that we don't, that we miss. Mm -hmm. 
So I've re been reading that. I just read, um, I think I'm up to date on all of the Deanna Rayburn's uh, Veronica Speedwell series. Mm. Um, I'm about to jump into Andrea Penrose's uh, historical mystery series, but I tend to take breaks between books because otherwise I gobble them like pastry <laughs> and sort of have that gutted feeling afterwards. So I like to, to go from thing to thing and, and um, I'm teaching a lot more now. So I'm trying to read other things to find it, find what I'm looking for in other people's books to, to see what, we could learn from them like this Shannon Hale, this goose girl, Shannon Hale, just this line, her nightmare clung to her like the smell of smoke to cloth. Oh, nice. Visceral. You get that whiff of smoke up your nose while you're reading and you still get, and it's a foreshadowing for this book. It's just, you can find really great things in middle grade, in, smart ideas in history, beautiful language in romance, great perception in mysteries. I, I, there's nothing I don't like. Now, will you tell our guests where they can find you online? I am uh, still on Facebook, although I, every day I reassess that. Um, I am. I have a page on Facebook, Elizabeth Essex. Uh, you can find me in at least two places on Facebook, so I'm kind of easy to find. I am on Instagram as Essex Romance, and I like Instagram very much, so I spend more time there than any place else. Uh, I am on Twitter, but that's not. I don't know. It's political. Not everybody's <laughs> cup of tea. Twitter. Um, so I'm there, but I, uh, I don't say much on my own. I learn a lot on Twitter. I listen a lot on Twitter. I follow a lot of strong voices on Twitter that I think are worth listening to. Not always that I agree with, but I listen a lot on Twitter uh, or read, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it. But um, uh, I do a lot of, I did a lot of historical um, engagements uh before the pandemic uh i like things where i get to i like to sew so i get to make costumes i like dress up things where i can wear costumes with like-minded readers um so i've done a, i'm usually at things like that you just posted some pictures of yourself on instagram in costume did you make those uh yes most of the time i have oh my god I originally started sewing historical costumes uh, to put on my covers. When I went independent, I decided I really wanted to take that creative control. And I made a beautiful uh, silk plaid redding goat for Mad About the Marquis for my uh -huh. uh, highwayman character. And, um, and then I just started sewing more. And it's, it's easy to make them fit me. Because when you put them on a model, you can just close pin the back all up. And they still look <laughs> fabulous on these tall, lanky girls. Um, but yeah, I, I made them originally for my covers. And most of my covers now are uh, either costumes that I have uh, made myself or friends have made. Oh, my God. That's funny because when I was going through your catalog, that was the exact one. I noticed that it's the red plaid. Yes, it is. The red and plaid. I immediately thought you never, I, I never see that. Yeah. Well, that's why. And I gorgeous it was, cover. It was the first book I let out after I went independent. Um, so I really wanted to make it a strong visual image. And I really wanted it to say that this is an Elizabeth Essex book and you're going to get a heroine. <laughs> And she's going to be fabulous. And uh -huh. all that. she's going to take up all the page. So, <laughs> she's so going to take up all the page. I love that so much. Oh, good. <laughs> I, that's why I like to write those girls. I'm not that girl in real life. Uh, I'm, I'm adventuresome, but I'm not, I don't like taking risks. Uh -huh. <laughs> that's why I like writing about people who do, because I'm afraid of them. And I'm afraid of, uh, well, maybe it's because I'm old. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know. I find that a lot of authors, you know, they have a reputation for being meek and mm -hmm. 
in a lot of ways, the opposite is true because we do have these insane imaginations and we're always yes. all over the place in our minds. Yes. We don't really need to jump out of airplanes. No, no. It's enough of a risk every day to commit your thoughts mm. and your hopes and your emotions. Um, if I can't feel it, the reader won't be able to feel it. Mm. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a harrowing experience to write a book full of emotions. <laughs> Planes are nothing. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Elizabeth, this has been so delightful. I want to thank you for introducing me to this fantastic book. I can't wait actually to reread it. And I know it will become one that I pick up when I, like you said, need some souffle. Need a very, very savory souffle. (laughs) Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening, book nerds. For more information on this episode and links to all the books we discussed, please go to our website, bestbookeverpodcast.com, or follow the podcast on Instagram at bestbookever. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and you can find me everywhere as Julie Wrote a Book. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it on social media and leave a review on whatever podcatcher you use. Reviews really help our visibility to new listeners, and we are grateful for everyone. Thanks for joining me today, and I will see you at the library.